Hi, everyone. I'm Dan Fullerton, and today I want to talk to you about torque. Our objectives are going to be to calculate the torque on a rigid object and to apply conditions of translational and rotational equilibrium to analyze a rigid object under the influences under the influence of a number of forces at different points. So let's dive in and take a look by talking about what torque is. Torque, a vector, a Greek symbol tau, is a force that causes an object to turn. And you've probably talked about torque uh, sometime in your life previously. Torque must be perpendicular to the displacement to cause a rotation. Secondly, the further away the force is applied from the point of rotation, the more leverage you obtain. So the distance from the point of rotation to where you're applying the force is known as the lever arm because it helps you apply leverage. That gets the letter R. Think about trying to turn the bolts on a wheel as you change a tire. If you have your hands really, really close to the center as you're trying to turn, it's not going to work very well. But spread them way out, it takes a lot less force. That's because you have a longer lever arm. You have more leverage, therefore you're getting more torque. The formula for torque, it's the cross product of the lever arm R crossed with the force vector F. Because it's a cross product, a vector product, the torque itself is a vector. And the direction of torque we're going to talk about in a minute. It's not always obvious. The magnitude of the torque vector is the lever arm times F sine theta. This F sine theta, where's that come from? Well, if we look down here in our diagram for our wrench, we've got a lever arm R, our force F at some angle theta between this continued lever arm and the force. Well, really, only the force that is perpendicular to that lever arm counts. So we need this purple component of force. That's the opposite side. That's why this is F sine theta. Really what we're just saying here is the component of the force perpendicular to the, uh, to the distance to the lever arm, the line of action. So with that, let's go a little bit further and talk about the direction of the torque vector. Because it's a cross product, torque has a direction and it is perpendicular to the plane made by the lever arm R and the force. So the way to think about it, take the fingers of your right hand, point them in the direction of the lever arm, and then bend those fingers toward the force. Your thumb will point in the direction of the torque vector. Note that the direction of the torque vector isn't in the same direction of the rotation. It's, a not, very, it's not very obvious what the direction is and how that plays into the bigger picture until you've played with it for a while. If we talk about Newton's second law, in the translational world, the net force was equal to the inertial mass, the translational mass, m, times the angular acceleration. In the rotational world, we have the analog to that, sometimes called Newton's second law for rotation, where the net torque is equal to the moment of inertia, the rotational inertia of the object, times the angular acceleration. And as we talk about these, equilibrium problems or states of equilibrium oftentimes come up. Static equilibrium is the case where you have no net force and no net torque and your object isn't moving. Its velocity is zero. It's at rest. Dynamic equilibrium, on the other hand, your net force and your net torque are still zero, but now your object can be moving with a constant velocity, a constant translational and a constant rotational velocity, but it's not accelerating. So let's take a look at how we might solve an equilibrium problem with everything we've talked about so far. In this case, we have a 10 kilogram tortoise over here sitting on a seesaw. He's one meter from the fulcrum and he has a mass of 10 kilograms. So the force down on the seesaw is going to be 10 times the acceleration due to gravity or 10 g. On the right hand side, we want to balance our tortoise with a hair of 2 kilogram mass. So the force, the gravitational force on our hair is its mass times acceleration to gravity, or 2 g's down, at some unknown distance from the fulcrum of our seesaw. Where must that hair sit in order to maintain static equilibrium? And let's also find the force on the fulcrum when we're all done. Well, the way I would start this is I would take a look at Newton's second law for rotation. Net torque equals I alpha. And in this case, we know the angular acceleration is going to be zero because we're talking about equilibrium. So the net torques must equal zero. Well, our net torque, well, we have one torque here from our tortoise with a force of 10 g and a lever arm of one meter. 
And note that this causes a counterclockwise rotation, so that's a positive torque. Over here on the right, we have our dear bunny with a force of 2g at a distance x. And because that would cause a clockwise rotation, that's a negative torque. And we know all of that must equal 0. So a little bit of algebra, 10g equals 2gx. Divide both sides by 2g. And I find x equals 5 meters. We want the bunny, the hair, to sit 5 meters from the fulcrum in order to maintain static equilibrium. It also asks about the force on the fulcrum. Well, that's just a standard translational Newton's second law application. Net force equals ma. And again, no acceleration, so that must be equal to 0. Our forces, we have 10g down, so minus 10g from our tortoise. We have minus 2g from our hair. And let's also not forget the force of our fulcrum over here. So that has to add in plus the force of our fulcrum all has to equal 0. Or negative 12g plus the force of the fulcrum equals 0. Pretty easy to see that the force of the fulcrum is going to be 12g, or if we estimate g, the acceleration due to gravity on the surface of the Earth is about 10 meters per second squared. That's going to be around 120 newtons. Okay, hopefully pretty straightforward applications of those laws. Let's get into something a little bit heavier. Let's talk about the standard beam problem. We have a beam of mass m and length l, and it has a moment of inertia about its center of 1 12th ml squared. Again, note that's right around its center point there. The beam is attached to a frictionless hinge at an angle of 45 degrees. There's our angle, theta, 45 degrees, our lever arm there. And it's allowed to swing freely. Find the beam's angular acceleration. Well, right away I can tell it's probably going to be helpful to know the moment of inertia around the end point because it's not swinging around the center point where its moment of inertia is given. I can do that using the parallel axis theorem because I know the moment of inertia around the end point is going to be the moment of inertia around the center point, the center of mass, plus total mass times the distance from that center of mass to the pivot point, which we'll call d. Or in this case, our little d is just going to be total length divided by 2. So that's going to be 1 12th ml squared, given in the problem, plus m times l over 2 squared. 1 12th ml squared plus, that's going to be ml squared over 4. That's going to come out to be 1 third ml squared. So that will be the, the uh, moment of inertia of our beam around this endpoint. That's going to come in handy here in just a minute. In order to solve this problem though, now let's go and take a look at Newton's second law for rotation again. Net torque equals I alpha. In this case, let's take a look at our net torques. What's causing the forces? First, we have this pivot point here is going to cause a force. But because that's at the point of rotation, its lever arm is going to be zero, no torque. We also have the weight of the beam as a force, mg. But note that that's not perpendicular to the lever arm. We need to figure out what that force is going to be, the one that's perpendicular. And to do that, I've got to bring in a little geometry. If this angle down here is theta, this must be 90 degrees here. That's got to be 90 minus theta, so that has to be angle theta again. If we want the force that's adjacent to theta, this is just going to be mg times the cosine of theta. And that's going to cause a clockwise rotation, so a negative torque. So I would write that as minus our force, mg cos theta, times our lever arm, half of the length, or L over 2. And that's the only force, our only torque we have remaining. And that must be equal to I alpha. And we know I now is 1 third ml squared. So let's solve for alpha. This implies then that alpha is going to be minus mg cos theta L over 2 
times our moment of inertia that we already figured out. Or let's write this out now, substituting in 1 third ml squared for a moment of inertia. I get minus mg, I'm going to put the L right there, cos theta over 2. And our moment of inertia is 1 third ml squared. So that's going to be ml squared 3. Now it's just a little bit of simplification. So alpha is going to equal. Let's take a look and see what we can uh, simplify over here. m over m make a ratio of 1. I've got an l in the top and the bottom. I've got an l squared here. So really, if I get rid of that l, I just have l down here. And I've still got my negative sign. So I'm left with minus 3g cosine of theta all over 2L. That's going to be our angular acceleration for our beam as it swings down. Application of Newton's second law for, uh, for rotation, along with taking a look at the parallel axis theorem to find the moment of inertia about a point other than the center of mass. Let's take a look at one more problem. Here we have a pulley with a mass attached to it. And this time it's a real pulley, not an ideal pulley. Our pulley has some mass and therefore an inertia. Mass m attached by a light string, so we can neglect the mass of the string. Radius r to our pulley and the mass of the pulley mp. Find the acceleration of the mass. All right, a couple things we can do to get started, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Newton's second law and start looking at my free body diagrams for the two key objects here. We have the pulley and we have the mass. So I'm going to start with the pulley and draw that over here. There's the center of mass of our pulley. We'll treat it as a disc. We have acting on it the normal force from that pivot, n. We have its weight, mp times g, and we also have some tension from the string over here at some distance r, which is going to be tension t. So as I look at that, the net torque is going to be i alpha, but in this case, our net torque, well, we've got a torque of T times R, our force times our lever arm, and that's at 90 degrees, so this, the uh, angle component there, we don't need to worry about it. They're already perpendicular. So our torque is going to be RT. And the moment of inertia of a disk, if you recall from our moment of inertia talk, or you could derive it, is going to be 1 half mass times radius squared. So that means that RT, our net, uh, net torque, is going to be equal to 1 half mp r squared times alpha. Or if I solve for the tension, that's just going to be, well, divide r from both sides, and I will get 1 half mp r alpha. But I'm trying to find a linear acceleration, not an angular acceleration. So I can use the translation that alpha is going to be a over r, or a equals r alpha, and write this as my tension equal to 1 half mp r alpha. I just replace with linear acceleration. All right, that looks like about as far as I can go with our pulley. Let's go look at the free body diagram for our mass. That's pretty straightforward. There it is. We have its weight mg down and the tension up. So Newton's second law right away is going to say that mg minus t equals ma. But I know what my tension is down here. I can bring that right up and say that mg minus 1 half mpa equals ma. If I add 1 half MPA to both sides, plus 1 half MPA plus 1 half MPA, I can pull out the acceleration and quickly say that the acceleration for our problem is just going to be MG over M plus MP over 2. 
So there's the linear acceleration of our mass now that we have a real pulley. Hopefully this gets you a good start on torque. If you need more information or looking for help, check out aplusphysics.com. Thanks and make it a great day.